Good morning and welcome to family and friends and visitors at Faith. We are so glad that you are here. As we celebrate our identity in Christ this morning, may we be blessed and moved to a greater service in his powerful name. Please rise if you are able and join us in singing All Hail the Power of Jesus' Name. of Isaiah 40. See the sovereign Lord comes with power and he rules with a mighty arm. See his reward is with him and his recompense accompanies him. He tends, to flock, he, he tends his flock like a shepherd. He gathers the lambs in his arms and carries them close to his heart. He gently leads those who have young. As God greeted us, so let us greet each other.
join me in a prayer of confession. Lord, you have blessed us so greatly. As a source of all good things, you desire our constant praise. Yet because we have sinned against you, even our worship fails to be what it could be. In our sin, we identify more with our work, schools, and interests than we do with your saving grace. In doing so, we have lost our identity in you. Renew us through the work of the Holy Spirit, we pray, according to your steadfast love. Remind us again of your blessed assurance that comes in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. The assurance of God's grace comes in song. Join us in singing Blessed Assurance. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchase of God. Born of the Spirit, washed in His blood. This is my story. This is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story. This is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. gratitude let us hear again his word god commands us to serve him alone as god to serve him according to his word to speak of him only with deep respect and love to attend faithfully the assembly of god's people on the day of rest and every day to let the lord work in us through his spirit to respect and cooperate with all god-given authority to nurture human life as god's precious gift to live purely and joyfully with the gift of sex to use the resources of this earth as stewards of God's creation. To use the gift of speech for promoting the truth and love. And to exercise purity of heart in all of life. May the Spirit of God guide us to be obedient to this word. Amen. Amen. Please join us in singing, O Four Thousand Tongues. Children may leave for toddler church and children's worship. Yeah. 
Good morning. morning. Turn in your Bibles to 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2. And I hope you had a great week this past week, even though this past Monday was called Blue Monday. Does everyone know what Blue Monday is? Blue Monday is the saddest day of the year. Ever since 2005, they calculated this based on the fact they have certain, and you can look at the equation online, look up Blue Monday, and they put certain things in the equations. Weather's number one, and this past Monday was a very cold day. So cold, our van didn't start in the garage. See where I'm going with this? So that also, you start to calculate, all of a sudden your debt comes due on Monday from Christmas. Oh, man. And then you realize on Blue Monday that you're not going to keep the resolutions that you made the New Year's. So there's some other factors they add in, but they call it Blue Monday the saddest day of the year. And I have no idea what your Monday was like. But I hobbled down the steps on the crutches. I was excited to get in the office and get to work. I am sick and tired of sitting around, to be very honest. I get down in there. I was ready to go. And the van, I knew it wasn't going to start. wouldn't even turn over. And I'm th- sitting there in the van outside, crutches up against the truck, thinking I can't jump it because the battery of the truck's on the other side. And in these vans, it's all down in the bottom. And I, sorry, I lost it. And I said some unpastorly things at the moment. (laughs) Because the circumstances of the day made me forget, made me disregard, made me not think of the identity I had in Christ. Ever have that situation in your own life when circumstances, things happen, and all of a sudden we forget who we are in Christ, who we promise to be, who we claim to be, who we profess to be. We forget that we are called to be His people in the world, as we're going to talk about this morning from our text. See, loss of identity is an important thing, financially speaking. I don't know if you've ever lost your identity online because of our interconnectedness in the world today. But they say it takes up to 500 to 600 hours to reclaim your identity, and it could even take up to seven years, seven years to make everything right after that time. And we better be serious about protecting our identity online. But I think as Christians, we need to be even more serious, spiritually speaking, about keeping our identity when we go off into the world. I've been talking about these last three weeks, about taking this passion, this fire, this identity, this this purpose, this perspective into the world. And our enemy is going to do everything he can to make us forget the promises we made, the commitments we made, to make us forget who we are called to be, to distract us from it, to get us all filled with everything that we can be filled with in our days. All the frustrations, all the sin, and we forget who we are called to be. Have you ever had that happen? Because when we forget who we're supposed to be, now, understand, the devil can't take our identity in Christ away. We're Reformed believers. Christ promises when He grabs a hold of us, when we have a relationship with Him, He will never, ever let us go. And we grab on and we promise to hold on to Him. But at times, the world distracts us and we kind of look our own way and do our own thing. We fall into sin. We have difficult days where the van doesn't start. We get caught up in ourself. And we also get caught up in the identities and the the definitions the world gives us. And we forget the love that Christ has for us and the identity we have in Him. I'm challenging you today, folks, when we go out, beloved, this week to come, to hold on to the identity you have, to keep that identity we have in Christ, firmly focused on it and who we are. Because some of us, we buy into all the identities the world has to sell us. Some of us are defined by what the world tells us to be. If I'm not this, I'm not worth nothing. If I can't do this, I'm not worth this. If I can't perform as good as somebody else, I'm that's not worthy. That is not who we are based on the world's definitions and the world's identities. So I want us to put a spiritual life lock into our lives today. Life lock is that company we see advertised a lot. You know, it talks about protecting your identity in line, but a life lock, spiritually speaking, based on 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 4 through 12. 
Please go there with me if you haven't so already. And before we look at it, let's bow our heads a moment. Father God in heaven, we come before you, your people. And Lord, that so often that we are distracted, that we are enticed, so often that we are drawn away from who we are called to be in you. And we get caught up in the world, caught up in sin, caught up in our own fame, our own glory, whatever it might be. But Lord, we are called to a purpose in this life. And that is to make you known, to give you glory as we will see in this text. But Lord, I pray that you would speak to our hearts because some of us, Lord, buy into the identities of the world today. We want to be what the world tells us to be. Some of us, Lord, think we're not even worth anything today. Because we're listening to what the world tells us we should be and we can't measure up. We use the wrong measure. Some of us, Lord, think too highly of ourselves. Some of us, Lord, are so caught up in sin that we can't even see our way out of it. And some of us, Lord, are struggling every day to hold on to that truth that's in you. And dear Lord, the world, even, even within the church, even within our communities that, that serve Christ, that look to Him, we are being drawn away. Reaffirm in us who we are this morning through your word, we pray in Jesus' name. And all God's people say together, Amen. Verse 4, chapter 2 of 1 Peter. As you come to Him, the living stone... Rejected by men, but chosen by God and precious to Him. You also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For in Scripture it says, See, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone, and the one who trusts in Him will never be put to shame. Now to you who believe this stone is precious, but to those who do not believe, the stone the builders rejected has become the capstone. And a stone that causes men to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobey the message, which is also what they were destined for. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God, that you might declare the praises of Him who called you out of darkness into His wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you have not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Dear friends, I urge you as aliens and strangers in the world to abstain from sinful desires which war against your soul. Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day He visits us. The word of the Lord. This morning we're going to talk about three things and we're going to be looking at three pictures today. But before we get to them, these are the three truths I want you to hear today. Who we were, who we are, and what we are to do. And the first thing we're talking about is who we were. And the first picture I have is a picture of a Japanese man. This picture was taken several years ago in Japan. And this is a member of what they call the lost generation in Japan. He's one of these gentlemen, these young men, who because of the economic situation that went south in, Japan, in, in Japan, there were no jobs, no careers, no positions, nothing that he could find to find a place for him to belong and make a name for himself and make a living. See, the Japanese culture was so invested in becoming a professional, becoming a person of success, becoming a person that had a career. That when there was no careers to be had, when there was no identity in that, that kind of economic situation, there was no place to place himself to show who he was, that many, come, many young men became the lost generations. This is what they became. Next picture, Kurt. They became lost. I want you to look at this picture as I read this. Across Japan, more than one million men and boys have chosen to withdraw completely from society. These recluses hide in their homes for months and years at a time, refusing to leave the protective walls of their bedrooms. They are as frightened as small children abandoned in a dark forest. Some spend their days playing video games. A few estimated 10% surf the internet. Many just pace, read books, drink beer, 
or Japanese vodka. Others do nothing for weeks at a time. The bottom came out on their identity and their culture. And they were left hanging. No drive to succeed. No sense of who or what they were to be. Instead, they became nothing. See, that's the picture of the lost. That's what we once were. We once were those terms he used. We once were in darkness. We once were not a people. We once were those who had not received mercy. Darkness means ignorance. We walked around not knowing who God was. And that's the condition of man without the Holy Spirit within him. At one time we were not a people, not a people united around him, not knowing God. And the picture in this text is of multitudes of people wandering around in the darkness, ununified, doing whatever they're not, buying into what the world has to offer, when in sense, truly in a sense, they are lost. They had not received mercy. Do you remember the day you received mercy? Do you remember the day that all of a sudden the Jesus thing, that person made sense? Do you remember the day when all of a sudden you realize, my sins are forgiven, I am free, and I don't have to buy into that stuff the world tells me to. I don't have to sit there and think I'm a loser. I don't have to sit there and think that I'm a waste. I don't have to sit there and work on trying to be a success because he loves me. Do you remember that day? Have you had that day? Where all of a sudden your heart says, I believe in Jesus. I hope you have. Some of it happens over a long period of time. Some of it at our profession. Some of it in the middle of the hardest times in our life. But have you had that day? Where He is the one and you received this mercy and all of the darkness was lifted and you came to know Him. Because that's the day that the world, the devil, doesn't want you to remember. Because that's the day that you became who you were supposed to be. That's the day where your identity became firm and who you were was set. And the devil's going to do everything he can. The world, just because it's a fallen place, is going to do everything it can by its nature to make us forget the identity we have in Christ through those circumstances I described easy, earlier. The question, I think, becomes, what identity are you living for today? What identity are you struggling for? What identity do you think of when you wake up? This is who I am. This is who I need to be. I remember a girl once I met on a swim project in Honduras. And she was this, this beautiful girl, talented in everything. And we came to this project, she was from California, and during the midst of the project, we talked a lot about identity. And she came once to talk to me afterwards, and the other leaders, other lady leader, were sitting there, and she with tears in her face says, I work for my position at school. I am in the popular group, I work for it. And what you're telling me, it doesn't matter. She says, no, it doesn't. That instant, she came to know the ignorance that she was in. She came to know the truth of who she was in Christ. She was freed from that identity that the world had placed on her. What identity are you pursuing? Who do you want to be? Is it the one that you want the world selling you? Or is it the one that God has for you that you were meant to have? See, we not only need to know who we were, where we came from, what grace we have been given, we get to also remember who we are. We need to remember that we are part of what God is building. The text talks about Jesus being that living stone. That corner stone. See, Peter uses this, this story, this episode from Isaiah 28, which refers to a time when Israel was, was trapped or had fallen into a covenant of death with Egypt. They had made alliances and promises and contracts with other countries, other human powers to be safe and secure and to succeed. See, they didn't identify with God as his people and say, we will trust in our Lord God in heaven. No, we're going to trust in others' military might. And instead of looking to God for that peace, instead of looking to God for that strength, instead of finding who they were in him, they found who they were in other people in the truth of the world. 
And they made promises which were covenants of death because the result was death. Because it all fell apart when Assyria showed up and they were destroyed and taken into captivity. See, part of our identity is placing ourselves, our lives, our trust, our circumstances, our situations, who we are, upon the firm foundation of the cornerstone that we have in Christ. He is the first stone that is laid, and from that, every stone gets its measure. Every stone in the construction finds its square in a sense. See, that's the good news that says in Isaiah 28. That Peter refers to, and Jesus said, I will lay a stone in Zion, and you can trust me, because I will save you. I will bring you mercy, and you will know life and be hopeful despite the circumstances that you face, despite the fact that the car doesn't start on a cold morning, despite the fact that the bills are due, despite the fact that yet you can't be disciplined to keep up with your resolutions, despite the fact that you're walking through a valley of difficulty. He comes into our stories, into our lives, to change who we are. To make us in who we are meant to be. And that story of the cornerstone that's laid is our story and that continuing story in our lives each and every day that we need to look to. Where we need to place our lives as we figure out who we are. Are we those who are seeing the fulfillment of His promises today? Do we believe what Scripture says about what Christ has done for us? See, in a sense, we're the new temple. They built that temple, Solomon built that temple, and people came from miles and miles and thousands of miles around to see this temple, and they'd see it, and they'd look, wow, look at the glory of the God of the Israelites. And they were amazed. But this cornerstone that was laid means that spiritually he's building a house, a temple. He's building into us a purpose, a life in which people will look and say, Isn't our God amazing? For his glory, for who he is. I can't see if that is our purpose, our, our meaning, this is who we are. I can't see how we buy in to what the world has to offer. But it seems we respond so often. People watch MTV and they that's the way we're supposed to be. We have to drink. We have to party. We have to do all those things because that's expected of us in culture. We got to watch shows that show guys that, you know, they're rough and tough. They got to swear and all those things. And, you know, they don't need Jesus because they can pull themselves up by their own bootstraps. And we buy into that. Women buy into this idea that, okay, if your house isn't clean or, or if, if you're not doing this right and this right, you're not a good mom, you're not a good mother, you're not a good wife. It's not who you are. We are living stones being built together for a purpose to give our God glory. And in that is our identity, our purpose, and all that we are to live. In all that we do, yeah, the van won't start. Praise God that I could spend time with my dad who comes over to bring me a battery charger. Right? It's about perspective at that moment, isn't it? It's about how we're seeing things. But the question becomes, do you believe this? And is your life a life that gives God glory? Do people look at your lives and go, they love Jesus. That God they serve is amazing and awesome. I wonder sometimes what people think of my life when they see me. I mean, do you believe it true? This is to be true. And because if it's not true, why are we here today? If, it, if it's not true, if, it's, if this Jesus thing, this, this cornerstone is like Santa Claus, what are we doing here? Why be Christians? Let's go home. Let's go watch the game. Let's sleep in. Please let me sleep in, God. You know? But we're here because we do believe. And we need to understand this. We need to have this life lock in our lives of where we came from and who we are. And we have to remind ourselves of it all the time so we don't be distracted. We don't fall back into that old nature, that old self, constantly and consistently. So who were you and who are you leads to what we are to do. I love this picture. 
this little boy is singing into a microphone. I don't, can't see it on the picture, but all the notes are going out and they're flying all over the place, out into space. And what we need to do is we need to declare. The text says we are a people that are meant to declare, a holy nation, to declare the praises of our God. That word declare means in the Greek to make widely known His mighty acts. The greatest one is the fact that we have received salvation from His very hand. That salvation we talked about a moment ago. That, that, that's taken us from the darkness and from ignorance. From not being a people to people. From not knowing mercy to knowing mercy. This truth, that grace is what we need to declare to the people around us who are in that darkness. Even in the middle of our most trying situations is where we need to declare it the most. Not necessarily by what we say, but by what we do. How we handle the situation. And I have to be honest, last Monday morning, I did not declare properly. In fact, I missed it by a mile. We need to declare Make some noise in the middle of darkness. We need to proclaim good news to those trapped in ignorance. We need to tell those who have no idea who they are, who they're meant to be in Jesus Christ. We need to speak into a world, into the mess, into the muck of it all, and tell of His mercy. Think of those you know who don't know Jesus. Think about those in your life who don't know Jesus Christ at this moment. And then if you don't know anyone who doesn't know Jesus Christ, think about why you don't. And then imagine their life differently. And do you have the courage and the boldness to declare to them to make some noise who Jesus did? And in doing so, when you declare something, when you speak it, you know what you're doing? You're reminding yourself of that story that we just talked about. You're reminding yourself again of who you were and who you are and who they are and who they could be. You're reminding yourself of the grace of Jesus Christ as you declare it. And as you declare it more, and as you put it out there more, it becomes a spiritual memory that you become used to. Like muscle memory. Muscle memory is neat because you do something so often, then you just can't, you don't have to think about it, it just happens. Kind of like walking, kind of like breathing. Can you imagine the declaring of Jesus Christ in your life becoming like breathing? It's just something you naturally do. And you can't stop doing it. Because it's so important to life. And not only do we need to declare to those who are lost, I think we need to declare to each other. So often, I'm just as guilty as you are. We talk about the weather... And we can. I'm not saying that's wrong. Politics, especially after this weekend. We talk about all kinds of things, but do we talk to each other about grace outside of Bible study? Do we remind each other every day of what's coming and who we are and where we've been? Do we remind each other of the mercy? Do we remind each other of the truth? Do our conversations after church include grace and mercy? And prayer. Because all of us have blue Mondays. Some of us have blue Mondays every single day. Some of us struggle so hard to live the life for Christ because we are so conquered by what the world tells us. And some of us thrive in it, what the world offers us. We need to remind each other of the good things that it's going to be. And I, I want to... Pause here. I want to change some. Turn to Isaiah 25 with me. Isaiah 25. Sorry, Children's Church. Going long. Look at verse 6. I've read this with some of you, I think, already as I visited. But this is a good text. Maybe I've spoken from it here. But this is some of the things that we need to remind each other, declare to each other, and to ourselves as we live. This is one of the favorite texts of what's to come. If I may read it, starting at verse 6 through verse 9, Isaiah 25. On this mountain, the Lord Almighty will prepare a feast of rich food for all peoples, a banquet of aged wine, the best of meats, and the finest of wines. On this mountain, He will destroy the shroud that enfolds all peoples. The sheet that covers all nations. He will swallow up death forever. 
The sovereign Lord will wipe away the tears from all faces. He will remove the disgrace from his people from all the earth. The Lord has spoken. And in that day they will say, we will say, surely this is our God. We trusted in him and he saved us. This is the Lord. We trusted in him. Let us rejoice and be glad in his salvation. Do you hear what's coming, folks? And I declare it. We're going to get a feast with the best of meats. Better than Lorraine's prime rib. Sorry, Lorraine. Or maybe it will be Lorraine's primary. <laughs> That's common for us. We get to sit there with the ones who have gone before, our loved ones who have passed away, side by side at this feast, spread out before us, given to us by God, and watch death destroyed. Can you imagine that? We will be there. That's who we are. The people destined for a feast. I love feasts. I can't wait. I can't wait for all of us to be there. Because it never ends. It never ends. That's why this identity thing is so important, folks. That's why declaring to one another is so important. Declaring to the lost is so important. Declaring to yourselves so you don't forget what's coming. You don't forget where you were. And you don't forget who you are to be today. It's that important. Let our conversations be filled with grace. Let our actions be filled with love. Let our lives be filled with Jesus. Some things to think about in closing. Who are you? What are you pursuing as an identity in this world? Second one, what gives you your identity? What gives you your purpose? Do you declare, do you speak into the darkness your own and others. I guess the question is, do you believe it as I've been asked? Do you believe in the grace that He has given you? Do you believe that He's taken you from being lost to being found? Because how we believe is how we're going to live. About ourselves and those around us. And all God's people said, Amen. Let's pray. Father God in heaven, we come before you this morning. And dear Lord, I pray that your word has been convicting and has been convicting to me. Because so often I forget. So often I'm distracted. And in the middle of that distraction, that forgetting, in the middle of that frustration, do I go to your word? No. Do I sit and pray? No, I just let it build. I let it consume me. And then I can't live as you called me to live. Dear Lord, each and every one of us is guilty of this, and each and every one of us has an identity, spiritually speaking, that's at risk every single day. So Lord, help us to praise you, declare, to make known who you are. Help our souls say in our inmost being, help them to praise your holy name. Help us not to forget your benefits. Help us to know that you forgive all our sins, that you heal our diseases, that you have redeemed our lives from the pit, and that you crown our lives with love and compassion, and you satisfy our desires with good things so that our youth is renewed like the eagles. Lord, you are the one who does this. Help us to declare it to ourselves. Help us declare it to those around us. Father God in heaven, we come to you also with maybe some heavy hearts today. Maybe some difficult things. Maybe some struggles today. Maybe we, we are lost in this world. Our identity has been been sucked dry in you and everything else. Maybe we've got a heavy workload, <coughs> class load, studying. Maybe life's just too overwhelming. But before, Lord, we pray about those things, Lord, thank you for grace. Thank you for health and for safety. Thank you for each other, our church family this morning. 
Thank you for the ways that we can gather together to study your word each and every other day. Some of those studies starting today, some of those continuing today. Thank you for the opportunity to gather as households and have fellowship. Thank you for the elders and deacons and coordinators who, who put those things together. Thank you for the love that we can show one another. Thank you, dear Lord, for birthdays. For the years that you give us, we thank and praise you that Betty will have her 81st, 81st birthday this week. We pray that it will be a blessed one and that she would rejoice in your grace to her in those years. Lord, we also thank you that you walk with us when things get tough. We pray, dear Lord, for the Coy family today, for Elmer, dear Lord, and Karen. Elmer's sister Grace passed away, Lord. We pray that you would bless her family and also them. And give them your grace and mercy. Bless those who, Lord, who remember those who have gone on before. Bless and guide in the middle of loss. Help us to hold to your promises like never before. We pray, dear Lord, for Luke, who is suffering some nerve pain in his lower back and such. And We pray, dear Lord, that his time at um, Mayo went well and they found some answers. We pray for those, dear Lord, that walk in the valley of cancer. We think of Carol and Gert. We think of Bill. We ask, Father God, that you would Continue to encourage them and restore them and strengthen them. Help them in the middle of it to trust in who they are and you. And, and, and dear Lord, give it over to you when it's too, too hard and too difficult. Father God, too, we, we pray for our families here. Dear Lord, there are many babies coming to be, many babies being born. There are expectant mothers in our family today. We pray for health. We pray... Dear Lord, for blessing, we pray, dear Lord, for those families as they add more people, another child, and just bless them. Bless our young families, bless our middle-aged families with teenagers and high schools and college students and people going there. Bless, Father God, um, our older generation as well. Thank you that we are a family together. And dear Lord, just help us be united in your truth and your grace, united around you. Father God, we pray for Jana Vanderbilt as she will travel to Liberia from January 28 to February 6 to work in the orphanage of Christ for our hope. We pray for safety for her and her daughter and others and health and new and renewed relationships. We also pray, dear Lord, for Pastor Stephen, Stephen, Stephen Breen and Free Grace Reformed Congregation. We pray that you continue to bless them as well. Lord, thank you for this day. Thank you that you're a God who loves us, that you hear our prayer. Thank you that you're a God who drew us out of the muck and the mire and the lostness that we have. <coughs> Lord, when we look at our lives, we can see lives that are short and wearisome. We flourish like a flower of the field and the wind blows and we're gone. And we're not really remembered too much after the years pass, except a name on a stone. But because we trust in you, the living stone, Father God, we can know that from everlasting to everlasting, your love is going to be with those who fear you, and your righteousness with our children's children, for you will keep your covenant and remember us because of your love. That will take us into glory where we'll be with you. Thank you for your word today. Thank you for the songs of praises. Thank you, Father God, for this time together. We pray in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. This time, you stand and sing with us. Our song response, How Firm a Foundation.
This morning our offering is for General Fund and Christian Education Fund. Deacons may come forward and please join us in singing Cornerstone. found in Jesus, I invite you now to rise and join us in proclaiming we are servants of our risen Savior. Thank you. 
receive now God's parting blessing. May the Lord bless you and may he keep you. May he make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May he turn his face towards you and give you his peace. Amen. Thank you.